Good morning. Senate Committee on State Affairs will come to order. Will the clerk call the roll? Campbell? Present. Hall? Present. Lucio? Nelson? Here. Powell? Here. Schwartner? Present. Zaffarini? Birdwell? Hughes? Here. Gorm is present. Good morning. I want to announce that there's an overflow, overflow room in E1016. You've probably found that. There's folks that can point you to the way, E1016. Thanks, everyone, for being here. For the benefit of those here and also watching online in the overflow room, uh, there are other hearings going on, so you'll see senators in and out, know that their staff is watching this, they're watching, and so everything's being taken down. Your testimony is important to us. And so this time, the Chair lays out Senate Bill 1669-1669, recognizes its author, colleague Senator Hall, to explain the measure. Senator. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members. Members, there is a growing push for mandated vaccinations in the area of COVID-19. Some entities such as health care facilities, long-term care facilities, and municipalities are already requiring vaccinations as a condition of employment. My office has heard from multiple people around Texas who don't even work in health care, yet are still being required to get the COVID-19 vaccine as a term of their employment. Outside of the realm of employment, there is an increasing concern that individuals will struggle to continue functioning, functioning normally in a society as a whole. Sen Senate Bill 1669 does two things to address this issue. It prohibits vaccine mandates, whether public or private, and prohibits all discrimination and right of access restrictions based on vaccination status or proof of immunity. In short, this bill will prevent any type of discrimination or segregation based on vaccine or immunity status and would prohibit force, force vaccinations across the board. If you are an individual who has chosen not to take a particular vaccine or vaccines, this will, bill will help ensure that you can get or keep your job your health or life insurance policies, your access to government and private services, and more. Members, this protection and deregulation of businesses is something we discuss often and rightly so. It is not my goal with this bill to invade further upon private businesses. However, the chief responsibility and constitutional role of our government is to protect the rights of the individual. Employees can take off their helmets, masks, or uniforms at the end of the workday they cannot remove a vaccine. Vaccines for 20 different viral and bacterial illnesses not included in COVID-19 are on the CDC's recommended adult vaccine schedule. It is not right to treat unvaccinated individuals as if they are sick individuals or as if the choice they have made is morally wrong. No one in our society should be hindered from participating in business schools or our government just because they have made a very personal decision for themselves or for their children not to receive a particular vaccine or vaccines. The mere fact that a person has not received a specific vaccine does not make them a threat to others' health and safety. In contracts, the vaccines they have elected not to have may very well be a threat to their own health and safety. It is no secret that the COVID-19 vaccines are not FDA approved. The governor himself recently said, and I quote, here is a reality everybody needs to understand. These vaccines have not been formally approved by the FDA. They have not been approved for, they have been approved for emergency use operation. And that means no one can be required to take the vaccine. A little bit of history. In 2019, there were reported to the VARS 203 vaccine deaths. In 2018, 119, and 27, 85. Since December of 2020 through April 23rd of 2021, four months, there have been reported 3,362 deaths for COVID vaccine. That's roughly 30 people a day dying from this vaccine, or one of them. Vaccine Adverse Event Reporting System, VAERS, is estimated by most people that follow it as being less than 1% of what actually happens. Compare the COVID vaccine to the mandated vaccine for bacterial meningitis. 
One person died between the time of 2007 and 2015 for that vaccine. Folks, this is not about vaccines in general. In the four months of 2021, we've had more COVID-19 experimental vaccine deaths than all the vaccine deaths for the 15-year period between 1997 and 2013, plus almost 1,000 heart attacks and over 8,000 hospitalizations. In 1976, there were 45 million people were vaccinated for the swine flu. A mere 15 people died, and I don't say that lightly because any death is very regrettable, but the program was immediately halted because it was considered too risky. 53 deaths, and we've had approaching 4,000 with the COVID. Even vaccines that are FDA approved can still have significant side effects. The FDA's vaccine adverse reporting system contains 44,383 reports of Texans suffering from adverse events following vaccination. The federal government has also paid out more than $4.5 billion to vaccine victims through the National Vaccine Injury Compensation Program. The law passed in 1986, which created this compensation program, shields vaccine manufacturers and the medical personnel who administer the vaccines from liability. If a business requires you to take a vaccine, all the risk, physically and financially, is on you personally. The business has no responsibility if you have a mild adverse reaction, a lifelong disability, or even die. No one but you have to carry all the risk. The pharmaceutical companies and medical personnel have absolute and total immunity from anything that happens to you. You and your family will carry the entire burden, no matter what it might be, for as long as it may last. And members, I want to reemphasize that if we do not pass legislation to address this issue, then we are allowing mandates for vaccines that have injured people and for which medical personnel and manufacturers are not liable. It is well past time for Texas to lead in the fight against vaccine mandates and discrimination. Florida has already signed in a law bill that prohibits discrimination against customers and students who have not received the COVID-19 vaccine. Texas has long been known as the home of the Texas miracle, and people are moving here in droves to experience all that we have to offer. Our state has a tradition of being a safe haven for people to exercise their rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. It is time for us to be a leading example to the rest of the nation. With that, Mr. Chairman, I'm happy to take any questions, and we do have some witnesses. Thank you, Senator. Uh, members, any questions for the author at this point? Very well. We'll open testimony, begin with invited testimony. We'll call Dr. Richard Bartlett. Dr. Richard Bartlett. Doctor, welcome. Have a seat there. Get situated, and uh, when you're ready, introduce yourself and uh, give us your testimony. Good morning. Good morning. I'm Dr. Richard Bartlett, and I understand we might have some physicians on the committee, and that's great. Uh, we've been talking for the last year, since January 1, 2020, about COVID vaccinations, early therapeutic intervention, and we have uh, basically, sub there's been a lack of uh, information promoted on early outpatient treatment. Um, the hospitals were overwhelmed. You remember that? We had hospital shifts. We had uh, late care only. If people had uh, COVID, they were told if you have mild to moderate symptoms, just stay home and tough it out with Tylenol if you have, and then if you're sick enough, go in the hospital and we'll make a ventilator for you. And we started uh, pumping out ventilators. But at the beginning, 90% were dying with ventilators. And we were told to hold our breath and wait for a vaccine. But there is um, good news. Um, Oxford University uh, finished the STOIC trial. And in the STOIC trial, they found that 90% of hospitalizations for COVID patients could be prevented with early effective, with one medicine, inhaled budesonide. So I'm saying we have an alternative for Texans besides the vaccine. And Texans should have their rights. We should protect their individual rights. If they choose to go with early effective outpatient treatment, uh, that, that, that should be their right. We shouldn't take that away. 
Um, 90% of ER visits, 90% of urgent care visits could be prevented, according to Oxford University, the oldest university in the English-speaking world since 1096, 72 Nobel Prize laureates. They're a reliable source of information. They also did a second randomized control trial, which is the gold standard for uh, medical and scientific fact. Uh, that was the principal trial. And so both of them showed overwhelming uh, success at uh, helping people recover quickly, outpatient, early. It's a medicine that's uh, safe, readily available, inexpensive, and it's FDA approved, as opposed to the COVID vaccines, which are not FDA approved and by definition experimental, because we haven't had the time yet to uh, vet their safety and efficacy through and, and stamp them as FDA approved. But we have medicines that have been out for uh, Budesonide's been out for 28 years, FDA approved. It's been uh, used on two-pound preemie babies in the NICU uh, for decades safely. That's about as delicate a human as there is. So as far as safety, uh, we have that, but uh, Oxford showed the efficacy. And so I want to, my point is that we have alternatives to an experimental vaccine. Uh, we have uh, a safe, readily available, inexpensive alternative. And uh, patients should have their individual uh, right to decide what what direction they're going to go. I talked to Harvey Risch, the esteemed epidemiologist from Yale, yesterday, uh, and he said that by his calculations, 58% of Texans have uh, herd immunity from natural immunity uh, recovering from the, uh, the virus, COVID. Uh, and he said 33% have received the vaccine so far. So we have herd immunity. As an ER doctor, uh, working a 48-hour shift this weekend in Lubbock, uh, my understanding is there were only three uh, COVID patients hospitalized out of 300,000 population. So we're in a different situation than we were a year ago. In that 48-hour shift, I saw no COVID patients. And uh, that's different than it was a year ago where I was working in the ER and we'd see 10 uh, patients with COVID in a 48-hour shift. So we're in a different situation. We're not under the gun. Uh, we have herd immunity per Harvey Risch in Texas. Uh, there are still people dying, but uh, in January 1 uh, or, or mid-January this year, we had um, uh, herd immunity's effect causing the decline in uh, hospitalizations and deaths in Texas. And Harvey Risch says that that is the evidence of the effect of herd immunity. Do you have any questions? Doctor, thank you. Any questions for the witness? Senator Hall? Well, this, is, this is a layman's question because I'm not a doctor here. But, but uh, as I understand it, we've gone turn to vaccines in the past because we didn't have any place else to turn. Therapeutics or other treatments weren't working and they were very serious illnesses. And so it's... Where we are is what I'm hearing you say is, do you see, based on what you've known about treatments, and I'm not talking about curing anything, but treatments that, that have been shown to be effective in reducing the, the, the level of illness and deaths that exist that would make the vaccine unnecessary? Yeah, so I'm an ER doctor, and I teach advanced trauma life support, and in that, we stabilize patients. Airway, breathing, circulation, breathing is very important. And with COVID, it's a viral respiratory infection. We've had other viral respiratory pandemics, the H1N1 pandemic. We didn't have a vaccine to recover from that. It was herd immunity. Uh, that was a deadly disease. Uh, and uh, Harvey Risch says 58% of Texans herd immunity by his calculations is working. Um, but, uh, yes, the polio, uh, pan the polio epidemic, we did not have early, safe, effective, uh, treatments, uh, therapies. And, uh, with this we do. And, uh, the evidence is there. Oxford University has done the randomized controlled trial that, uh, just one of the possible, uh, treatments, budesonide, can prevent 90% of hospitalizations. Can you imagine 90% of 500,000 would be 450,000 Americans that died um, they usually die in the hospital. Um, does that mean 450,000 Americans could have possibly been saved if they were treated with early effective treatment? Okay. I guess the only other question I'd have is that uh, it appears that the mandates are being 
level across the board without regard to the person's susceptibility or risk level or whether they've had the COVID or not? Do you see any problem in people that have actually had the COVID getting the vaccine or those you know, that aren't at risk? Excellent question. And so uh, working in the ER, I'm now seeing more people come in who are having complications from the COVID shot. Um, they're short of breath uh, for two weeks after they received the shot two weeks before. Uh, they're having temporary neurologic episodes where their legs don't work and they fall flat on their face. Um, they're having dizziness, shortness of breath, and lightheadedness and feel like they're going to pass out. And so I'm seeing more, at this point, more complications from the shot in Lubbock, a college town, 18-year-olds coming in uh, in excellent health before the shot coming in four days later with four days of symptoms or a gentleman who's short of breath for two weeks or the lady who falls flat on her face. And so it's, I am seeing complications afterwards uh, that's being reported. But uh, um, I, in this last shift, I had no COVID patients come in in 48 hours. So we're in a different state now. And I would mention that um, I have given advice to the state before. Uh, Governor Rick Perry asked me to give advice on the Texas Health Disparities Task Force so no Texans would be left behind on quality care. And as a result of the seven years of service, the commissioner of Texas HHS uh, gave me the Meritorious Service Award uh, for my contributions. And so I've been sought out for my advice before, and it's been valid. And uh, fortunately... Um, Oxford University has stood up and, and proved that we have some effective therapies. Thank you. Thank Doctor, you for your thank service. You. Doctor, thank you for your testimony. Thank you for being here very much. The chair calls Dr. Ben Edwards. Ben Edwards. Dr. Edwards, welcome. Get situated there, then introduce yourself and give us your testimony. Thank you, Ben Edwards, trained as a family physician, did my undergrad at Baylor, UT Houston Medical School, and then Waco for family practice residency training where I was chief resident. I spent the first seven years in private practice at Garza County Health Clinic in Post, Texas as the only physician in the county. The last seven years, eight years, I've had my own practice, Veritas Medical in Lubbock, Abilene, and San Angelo. We have offices Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. I'd like to begin with a reminder to everyone about the definition of evidence-based medicine that Sackett, Strauss, et al. laid out back in 2000. They stated that the elements of evidence-based practice are the integration of best research evidence with clinical expertise and patient values. Patient values trump clinical expertise, and clinical expertise trumps the scientific evidence. <clears throat> I'm also concerned that the forced and coerced COVID-19 vaccinations would, in my opinion, be a violation of the Nuremberg Code, the UN International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, Article 7, the UN Universal Declaration of Human Rights, Article 3, and UNESCO's Article 6 of the Universal Declaration of Bioethics and Human Rights. In addition, I have some concerns similar to what uh, Senator Hall already mentioned. According to the CDC's Vaccine Adverse Event Reporting System, which I have some updated numbers from last night when I downloaded these, 4,178 deaths are now being reported on VAERS. To give some context, over the past 20 years, all vaccinations combined, there were a reported 4,182 deaths over the past 20 years. In the past four months, we're now sitting at 4,178 deaths associated with the COVID vaccine reported to VAERS. This includes a 15-year-old boy in Colorado, two 16-year-old girls in Wisconsin, 17-year-old girl in Wisconsin, and a 17-year-old boy, all healthy. He was in New Hampshire. <clears throat> The evidence is pretty clear that VAERS grossly underestimates the adverse events that are reported. A study commissioned by the Department of Health and Human Services, this is in 2010, and Harvard carried out this study. And the conclusion was only about 1% of adverse reactions are ever reported to VAERS. A similar study in 2015 by Shimbukru et al. 
came to a similar conclusion. A 1995 report by CDC also found that certain adverse uh, reactions to vaccines are reported about 1% of the time. Even the vaccine manufacturers themselves have estimated a 50-fold underreporting of adverse reactions. So I have grave concern about the underreporting of these adverse reactions to VAERS. And even at that, we're over 4,000 now in deaths. To give you some context, as uh, Senator Hall already mentioned, the 1976 swine flu epidemic, after recording 500 cases of paralysis and 53 uh, deaths, the vaccine was pulled off the market. Personally, I've received numerous reports from family members of my patients, close friends to my patients, that within hours to days of receiving the vaccine, they've suffered from stroke, heart attack, pulmonary embolism, blood clots, sudden death. And as far as these family members knew, none of these were reported by the medical staff as being associated with the vaccine. So my concern is there is indeed a vast underreporting. Lastly, I would say that of Harvey Rich's data that 53% of, of Texans are, have natural immunity, studies have shown a two- to three-fold increased risk of adverse reaction to this vaccine if you've already had COVID. Natural immunity infers a more robust immunity than vaccine immunity could, but vaccinating someone who's already robustly immune increases their risk of adverse reaction two- to three-fold two different studies that show that. And probably the last uh, thing I would have to say is um, I'm very much a proponent of preserving the individual doctor-patient relationship. It's a sacred relationship, and, and I believe nothing should come between that. And uh, ultimately, it's up to the patient to decide how they want to treat their body. Um, and on a personal note, I believe that God gave us an amazing, robust immune system, and I don't think you can improve on God. No one, not everyone obviously has to agree with that, but for those that do and choose to rely on that natural immunity, I think we need to uphold that right to do so without any adverse um, outcomes on their livelihood. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. Happy to answer questions. Dr. Barnes, thank you. Uh, any questions from the witness? Senator Hall? I do have a couple of questions for you. One, one is... Uh, do people with natural immunity to COVID need a vaccine? And is there any increased risk of the natural immune system individuals having an adverse reaction to the vaccine? Natural immunity is more robust than vaccine immunity. There's a study from the original SARS um, back in 2002. The people that survived that first SARS, they've looked at them 17 years later, and they, this, they showed a robust immunity still to SARS-CoV-1. 17 years later. Historically, we've already, we, we've always known that natural immunity tends to last a lifetime, i.e. the measles. Natural immunity will last a lifetime. So no, I don't believe there's any need to vaccinate someone who's already acquired natural immunity. And we need to remember natural immunity is more than just antibodies. You have T cells, natural killer cells. You've got the innate immune response. You've got a robust immune system, not just antibodies. And to the second part, reiterating that if you've already had COVID naturally, and some of these will be asymptomatic people, and some people won't have a positive antibody test because their T cells were strong enough, they didn't need to mount an antibody response. So you can't catch all these guys with an antibody screen. But if you've had natural immunity, over 50% of the Texans have, then you're at a two- to three-fold increased risk of adverse reaction if you get vaccinated. Mm -hmm. can, can people do anything about their immune system? Absolutely. Thank you for asking, Senator Hall. I transitioned from conventional family practice medicine to integrative medicine, integrating our God-given natural ability for the body to fix itself. And it's clear in the literature that if we steward this God-given design through nutrition, proper nutrition, hydration, exercise, sunlight, most importantly, peace, not fear. Fear has overcome this nation. The spirit of fear that I don't submit to has overcome this nation, in my opinion. And if that's influencing policy decisions, I don't, I don't want to have to be subjected to those policies. So, yes, there's much that you can do to improve your immune system. And it sounds too simple, but it's true. Eat God food, not man food. Exercise, get some sunlight, move around a little bit, and most importantly, be at peace. Your immune system will do what it's designed to do. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Edwards. I don't, that's... Doctor, thanks for your testimony. Thank you for being Welcome. here. Welcome. Thank you all. Thank you
The chair calls Dr. Amy Offit. Dr. Offit, welcome. Get situated there and uh, introduce yourself and give us your testimony. Good morning. Good morning. Um, my name is Dr. Amy Offit. I'm a practicing physician in Marble Falls. I've been practicing in the Texas Hill Country for about 21 years, and I'm here today to provide my uh, own medical opinion regarding the current state of COVID-19 medical management in our state, specifically related to whether or not requiring the EUA COVID-19 injection is appropriate. What makes me uh, uniquely qualified to speak today is that I've been actively, successfully treating patients since March of last year for COVID-19, acutely outpatient with effective treatment regimens. Um, I first drafted a treatment plan after researching strategies in late 2019 when I saw what was happening in other parts of the world, and then I fine-tuned it with input from other U.S. treating doctors like Dr. Bartlett over the course of the past year. Because these treatments were working, Despite all the controversy out of a strong ethical obligation to care for my patients, I continue to treat as num the numbers of sick people increased last year. As of last Friday, my practice has treated 579 acutely ill patients as old as 98 years of age with only 10 hospitalizations and one death. The man who died presented on the 12th day of illness was a transplant patient and had already been to the ER multiple times before seeking care from us. This was such an unnecessary tragedy. Of 433 other patients who've been given preventative regimens and tracked, only 10 have developed COVID and were easily treated, resulting in an illness rate in my practice of less than 1% for those taking preventative medication. The, these data are real. They're my own numbers from my own practice. Um, and I also do have some past experience working in the clinical pharmaceutical research industry before going to medical school. So that influences some of my thinking regarding uh, the subject. One of the main things I wanted to share today was that informed consent is the core to shared decision-making and good medicine. In fact, the American Medical Association has published a code of medical ethics about informed consent that says, informed consent to medical treatment is fundamental in both ethics and law. Patients have the right to receive information and ask questions about recommended treatments so that they can make well-considered decisions about care. Successful communication in the patient-physician relationship fosters trust and supports shared decision-making. That builds on some of the previous testimony about um, sharing in these decisions with our patients. Presently, we're hearing stories about companies and universities requiring these injections in order to remain employed or enroll in school. Such mandates for college students is especially surprising to me as, most, as they are some of the most low-risk individuals. This simply doesn't make medical sense. Um, even referring to the package inserts for these injections uh, gives us further evidence, and I pulled some language from those. The safety languaging in the package insert uh, states that additional adverse reactions, some of which may be serious, may become apparent with more widespread use, and that the following must be communicated to each recipient or their caregiver prior to each dose. It must be communicated that these are not FDA-approved vaccines, that the recipient or their caregiver has the option to accept or refuse the vaccine, and that the significant known and potential risks and benefits of the vaccine and the extent to which such risks and benefits are currently unknown. The informed consent documents refer patients to a fact sheet that the FDA has approved. This fact sheet instructs patients and clinicians to report side effects to the vaccine adverse event reporting system, which has been referred to earlier this morning in testimony. Um, and it goes further in saying that it's mandatory for all vaccination errors, serious adverse events, cases of multi-inflammatory syndrome in adults, and hospitalizations in fatal cases be reported. With these mandates, um, if we turn to the VAERS data, which has already been presented today, um, there are significant numbers that we need to listen uh, and investigate further. In fact, I checked last night uh, here in Texas, you can query just for the state, it currently shows that there have been 47 Texans who have died following Pfizer injection and 62 following Moderna injection. And I can tell you from being a practicing physician that many times if someone dies a few days later, if the doctor doesn't believe it's related, they don't even think about reporting it. I encourage you to look at the data for yourself. Um, you can go online to vares.hhs.gov. 
Uh, safety has got to be a priority for our state as we follow ongoing data collection for these injections, which are still under study. The package goes on, uh, package insert goes on to report that there's insufficient data to inform pregnant or breastfeeding women about the risk associated with this vaccine, but we are still allowing it. The package insert also discloses that the safety data for adolescent minors is extrapolated from adult data, and extrapolated data uh, shouldn't be used to make such decisions. Um, I, my medical opinion is that we must preserve Texans' right to have medical autonomy, especially in this situation. Doctor, thank you very much. Senator Hall, any questions for the witness? Uh, just a couple. Go ahead, please. What, you've, you've now treated over 500 patients. What, what would you tell one today, somebody coming to see you, uh, seeking, uh, thinking about doing the vaccine? What would you tell them? So I think based on some of the previous testimony, I, I agree that if they've already been sick with it, um, they should have a naturally acquired immunity that should be protective. And I would ask them to honestly wait a little longer and let some more safety data be collected before deciding if they haven't decided. And at the same time, I agree with um, one of the previous speakers that it is the patient's choice. If the patient wants the vaccine uh, and they feel confident in it, um, I encourage them to read and make an informed decision and then proceed but, how they feel is best. And you have worked with vaccines in the past. This is, this is not an issue of vaccines in general. We're talking about COVID. Yes, I, I'm, not, COVID I'm not against vaccination. Um, I think it should be each person's um, personal medical situation that's considered. We do that with every medical decision. It's risk versus benefit with each person sitting in front of us every day, each decision we make. <clears throat> So you'd say that the high number of incidents we've had of people being hospitalized and dying is significant enough that it, it would be a, considered a risk that you would at this time? I think if, if someone asked me what to do, I would stratify everyone into a low-risk or high-risk group. Mm -hmm. I would not worry, honestly, too much about the low-risk patients. I would offer them prevention if they so desired. And for the high risk, I would encourage them to choose some sort of preventative regimen. Um, although it is true that the numbers are dying off, even in my practice, I'm getting a lot less sick patients mm -hmm. calling asking to be treated. So, so how did you manage to get through this? Um, I assume you are okay with the COVID, uh, got through it okay. How did, what did you do for you yourself and your staff? So I, I myself took the preventative regimen that I've prescribed for my patients, and I offered it to all my staff. Um, if even my staff wanted the vaccine, I told them to get it. I, I'm not against it. I just think it is a bad idea to just shotgun give it to everyone. There's, there are too many other factors to consider. Um, I felt I'm, I have antibodies. I've tested my blood three times. I still have very robust antibodies a year after um, my first set were positive, and so I'm not worried about myself um, getting it even when I'm treating patients in the same room if they're sick. Okay. All right. Thank you, Dr. Offit. Thank you. Thank you. Doctor, let me ask one more thing. Oh, doctor, if you don't mind, I've got a, I've got a couple more. Thank you so much for being here. That's fine. Uh, and this is all very helpful testimony. We were talking about the, the, the the physician before you was talking about antibodies and folks who've had it before, and we were talking about T cells and how there could be cases where you have immunity, but it's but you're not going to the antibodies won't show up. I'm butchering this, but everybody but me understands this better than I do. Say someone has had COVID-19, uh, they had a positive test, had the symptoms some months ago, last year, whatever. Do we assume that they have? Immunity or not necessarily, and this I really want to know. This is not a trick question. I hear different things, and I'm I'm, I'm curious. If, if if you had a positive, whatever that that foot long up your nose, brain scraping <laughs> test is, and you had the flu like symptoms and lost your taste of smell, this is not just about me. I'm just curious in general. If you've had it, if you had a confirmed case a year ago, six months ago, is there a way to determine whether you have immunity? I, I don't. I hear different things. I'm curious. It's a very good question, and I think it's it's again an individual patient consideration yes, because yeah. someone with good health, just as Dr. Edwards was referring, someone who's healthy is probably going to have a more robust immune response. Okay. Uh, presently, there are labs, some of the big labs we use to do regular routine testing that do offer antibody testing, and I I sometimes run that for patients who are curious. 
Um, sometimes patients were a little sick and didn't go to the doctor and didn't get a test, but they feel like they may have had it. They're, you know, they're wondering. Um, there's even is now a T cell test that's on the market. That's $150. The patients can order it online for themselves. They don't need a doctor's order. Um, that's reports a 99% specificity, which is pretty high. So I think if we use logic and reason and look at the patient, I mean, I don't require a test to, to feel someone's immune. If they were clinically positive for COVID, I would have a very uh, strong leaning that they are immune and that mu immunity is lasting. If they would feel safer to be on a little preventative coverage, I'm happy to offer it. It's very safe. It's very cheap. It's very easy to get. Um, it's underutilized, but it's there for, for patients who want it. And so um, I think it is possible to find out if you're immune, like my antibodies. I've tested them three times, April, October, and March, and I have a robust ongoing immune response. So um, I've found the same to be true for other patients who've had a clinical case and then later done antibody testing. Thank you. Good question. Thank you very much. And your testimony and the, the, the doc before you piqued my interest about that because we've heard different things about that. That's very, thank you all for putting it together for us. Is there, is there any other questions for the witness? Thank you for being here. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you, Jared. Thank you so much. Where's mine? You want some? <laughs> you can drink out of that side. I'll no. drink out of that. You drink out of that. Have you been back? <laughs> Good question. I've got the antibodies. So do I, because I've had this crud too. <laughs> me too. <laughs> yeah, those questions weren't just about me, but there are other folks in the same situation. Uh, chair calls Dr. Angie Farella. Dr. Farella. And well, the record, the uh, minutes will note that uh, Senator <coughs> Birdwell is present, Senator Lucio is present. Thank you. And, and Senator Campbell's back. As I mentioned, for those just joining us, there are multiple meetings going on. And many members of this committee chair other committees and non other committees, and two or three at the same time. So they're in and out. Staff members are here. Staff members are watching. This is all being taken down and, and listened to. So thank you all for being here. Doctor, welcome. Introduce yourself and give thank us your you. testimony. Thanks for having me this morning. My name is Dr. Angelina Farella, and I am a pediatrician in Webster, Texas, independent solo physician. Um, I have come here today really to uh, protect our children of Texas. This is a very scary situation that we're in right now. Um, I just want to kind of touch on a few things, some history. Um, never in history before have we given medications that were not FDA approved to people that were not initially studied in the trial. Um, there were no trial patients that were under the age of 18. There were no trial patients that were previously exposed or had COVID. These are two very important points with this. The other um, issue is safety. I'm kind of a safety freak. I'm a pediatrician. I've been a pediatrician for over 25 years. I find myself a vaccine expert. I've given tens of thousands of vaccines in my office. I am not an anti-vaxxer. I'm a very pro-vax actually, except when it comes to this COVID vaccine, if we can call it that. The, um, one of the big issues is the safety profile. Um, the safety and the adverse offense um, recommendations through the ACIP, which is the Advisory Committee of Immuni Immunization Practices, they have re made some recommendations in regards to the COVID-19 vaccine. Um, one of the things that is extremely troubling, and it's on their ACIP guideline for the Pfizer vaccine in particular, that recommendations about safety and adverse events will come out after authorization. After authorization. This is a very scary issue. We find out data on safety before we subject our patient population to this. We are currently allowing children 16, 17 years old to get this vaccine and they were never studied in this in this trial. On top of that, these kiddos, um, they're extrapolating the data from adults down to children and adolescents. This is not acceptable. Children are not little adults. Not acceptable at all. Um, children have a 99.997% survivability from the COVID. 99.997% nine nine seven percent let me repeat that for you all to understand and there's evidence that these children are actually a buffer 
And what that means is that these children actually, for some reason, do not spread the disease. Children are not super spreaders. So what we're doing to our kids right now is actually criminal. We are, we are isolating them. We are putting them in masks, which is also clinically dangerous. We are also telling them that psychologically telling them that if they bring COVID home, they're going to kill grandma, granddad, aunt, uncle, mom, and dad. That is a horrible, horrible situation to put on our kids. Let me go back to the rotavirus vaccine of 1999. I've been in practice long enough that I actually was giving rotavirus back in 1999. And um, it was pulled off the market then because of 15 cases of intussusception. Intussusception is where the gut telescopes on itself. Intussusception is not necessarily life-threatening. It sometimes self-reduces, um, but the rotavirus vaccine was actually pulled immediately, and we stopped giving it to our kids. And what has happened with this particular um, vaccine is appalling to me. We have in excess of 4,000 deaths, and this thing has not been pulled yet. This is absolutely unacceptable. The, on top of that, you know, a few years ago, maybe some of you don't understand that we had a flu epidemic um, pandemic in uh, 2017, and it killed 95,000 Americans. And 95,000 Americans died despite the fact that we have early effective antiviral treatment for the flu. Okay. We now have early effective outpatient treatment for COVID. We've had it for a long time. As a pediatrician, I stepped up to the plate in Texas to help Texans, adults, because doctors in my community shut their doors, locked their doors, and refused to treat patients. I've seen hundreds of adults, active COVID. I've also treated post-vaccine problems in adults. This is, again, me stepping up to the plate. I'm becoming very vulnerable because as a pediatrician, this is not my wheelhouse, but I, my wheelhouse is infectious disease. I see lots of little kids. They are Petri dishes. The reason why they're a buffer is exactly that reason. They have something called a thymus. A thymus helps them with T cell immunity. So that's another point for you to understand. Thank you for allowing me to speak. Dr. Thank you. Senator Lucio has a question for you, Senator. The, the people that you stated have uh, died because of uh, influenza, um, what percentage of those people had had that early, early, what? Um, mm -hmm. Early, effect, like uh, Tamiflu or Amantadine or other antibodies. I mean, were these people that died that didn't have any kind of uh, there, medication? Well, that's a very interesting question because the way the influenza is recorded, it is not an actual reportable disease in some counties, states. So the national numbers through the CDC are estimates, but we know that it's available. You, I mean, it's, I, I understand it's that, but you see, you led me to believe that they had died even though they had there's there's availability to that Correct. medicine but you, know, you led me kind of to believe in in your presentation that uh, they had died um, even though some of them had taken i'm sure there there i'm sure there were some that did take it yes there's high risk individuals that we we can only do so much well, well we don't have but there's uh, no there's no statistics doubt. or anything Correct. Um, are you here uh, testifying uh, for yourself or for the um, your you know your profession your pediatricians let's say of Texas myself yourself okay thank you thank you Senator any other questions for the witness Senator Hall with your experience you're talking about going back to 1999 or maybe before is there been another vaccine that had the high incidence of, uh, of serious uh, uh, hospitalizations and deaths that uh, this vaccine is, is now showing? Not, not to this extent, absolutely not. Not even, this one, not even, not even close. close. Not even close. Any other vaccine would have been pulled from the market. Absolutely. It would have been pulled probably within the first few, just right. as we've seen in the past. What was it? it? And have you seen any other vaccine that was put out for the public that skipped the animal test? Never before, Skip. especially for children. And, and as I've, what I've read, they actually started the animal test, and because the animals were dying, they stopped the test. Correct. 
Folks, I think that's important to understand there that, that what we're talking about is the American people are now the guinea pigs. This is the test program that's going on. They, they didn't do the human testing, and they stopped the animal test because the animals were dying. And then they turned it out for the public. And we are now looking at businesses that want to mandate that this experimental vaccine be given to people as a condition of their employment. And yet we have this death count that continues to rise and be totally ignored out there. So do you agree with what I was saying, Absolutely. Dr. Absolutely. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank Appreciate you. you and your work. Thank you, Senator Hall. Senator Lucia. Question of Senator Hall. Yes, sir. That's a pretty strong statement. Do you have data that we can look at to see uh, what happened on those? Uh, for, uh, it's it's on the initial. It's, it's on, it's on the TV's website. It's on the TV website. Yes. Can you direct us uh, through that website? I'd like I'll, to see I, that. I will get you. Yes. I'd like to see if if they how many they tested and, and in fact if they stopped testing because animal, animals were dying. Okay, that, I, will, I will get that for you. Thank you. Thank you, Senators. Any other questions for the witness? Thank you for being here. Thanks Thank for your you. testimony. And we, a number of folks have expressed their intent to, uh, to testify. We're going to hear from everyone that wants to. However, we cannot do that while the Senate is in session, and we have to go into session at 10 o'clock. And so in a few minutes, we're going to stand in recess and we're going to we'll plan on coming back at 12:30 or when the Senate adjourns whichever is later. Does that make sense? So just hang loose uh 12:30 or when the Senate adjourns. So if it gets to be 12:30 the Senate's still going, we can't start yet, but we'll get going when the Senate adjourns. So that's all we know. And to further complicate things, uh we're probably going to be back in this room, but we may be in the Senate chamber. So just listen for the announcement. If you come here, we'll direct you to the right place. So with all that, uh, everybody who wants to testify is going to get to testify. You'll be heard. We're going to listen to you. So if there's no other business at this point, the Senate Committee on State Affairs stands in recess until 12.30 p.m. today or adjournment of the Senate. Thank you. Good morning.